And um, welcome again to a webinar hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy to Toolbox or CCAST. My name is Genevieve Johnson. I'm a program manager for the Bureau of Reclamation and I'm a federal co-director of CCAST with Matt Graybaugh from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. CCAST is intended to support landscape scale conservation and restoration by enhancing issue-based peer-to-peer knowledge exchange through the development of case studies, workshops, and webinars like today's. We use case studies, workshops, and webinars as sort of the foundation for these communities of practice that are addressing these issues. Um, we are addressing drought adaptation, which is a focus of today's webinar, as well as grassland restoration and introduced aquatic species. If you would like any more information on CCAST or our communities of practice, feel free to email me or Anna Weinberg, who's also on the video with us today. Um, and we'll put our email addresses into the chat in just a, section, a second so you can have those for contact. Um, and with that, Anna, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Genevieve, and thank you all for being here today. Um, my name is Anna Weinberg, and I work with the CCAST team at the University of Arizona based in Tucson. Uh, I joined CCAST a year ago as the coordinator of our drought adaptation community of practice. Today, we are hosting a presentation from Louise Mitzel about the Sky Island Alliance's work monitoring and developing tools to support management of spring ecosystems in the Southwest. Luis is the executive director at Sky and the Alliance, a conservation organization working to protect and restore the diversity of life and lands in the Sky Island region of the US and Mexico. She has worked at Skyland Alliance for the past 15 years, leading climate change adaptation initiatives to support natural resource managers in understanding impacts on ecosystems and wildlife, crafting collaborative approaches to responding and developing projects to study and stored spring resources. A uh, final reminder before I turn it over to Luis, if you have questions during the presentation, please enter them in the chat box and I will relay them to our speaker afterwards. With that, Luis, feel free to unmute yourself and we are ready for you. All right, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, I really appreciate the work of CCAST and watching all of that develop over these last years. So um, thrilled to be a part of supporting the CCAS community. Um, I am going to talk today, um, as Anna said, about some work we've been doing with a lot of focus on spring ecosystems, um, thinking about drought and, and bigger picture climate changes and how we get a handle on understanding where these ecosystems are and their status and how we think about uh, managing them, protecting them, and more broadly, protecting water for the environment. And I think uh, Anna had me covered on this. Sky Island Alliance is a, an NGO conservation organization working to protect the diversity of life and lands. And um, uh, something I will note is that we um, do our work through, as an alliance, through collaboration with lots of different land management agencies, resource management agencies, um, volunteers and uh, uh, partner scientists are an important part of our alliance. And so it's a big community of folks that we're working with to do these kinds of projects. And for anyone who may not be uh, tuning in from the region, just in case Sky Islands or Sky Island region um, is not familiar to you, here's a look at where it is in the world. Um, it's this area where we have forested mountains rising up out of desert and grassland seas um, in southeastern Arizona and northern Mexico, and uh, an incredible biological diversity hotspot, and a lot of springs here as well, which is an interesting piece of the story. So I'll walk you through a little project context and then focus on sharing some uh, outcomes and tools with you, including our springs prioritization tool some work we've done around monitoring approaches and thinking about uh, what we've learned from looking at different monitoring approaches for springs. Um, we've got a, an update to the Arizona Spring Restoration Handbook and some policy uh, information to share with you around environmental flows that was part of this larger project. So this project, um, Sky Island Waters, we called it, changing the way water is valued, used, and managed. Um, it was really born out of thinking about climate change adaptation and springs um, became a big focus for many 
managers across the region when we started thinking about important places to focus attention um, for resilience as the climate changes and we face long-term drought. And we saw this need to promote dialogue, understanding, and innovation by water managers and natural resource managers um, looking towards securing water for natural areas. Um, and so some of the things, uh, fake challenges uh, we were looking to address with this project include a lack of regulatory framework and funding for this kind of work. I'm not going to go into too much depth on this, but prior appropriation of water is the, the law of the land around here. And there are, are a lot of regulatory challenges around protecting water for nature. Um, lack of science or, or on the ground information to fully understand ecosystems and species need for water. Um, we need to obviously make informed decisions to get enough water in the right places to support resilience. And then of course, this bigger context of extreme drought and heat, um, increased human demand for water and our warming climate that's contributing to all of this. And so this project focused on developing tools and information to support decision making, planning, and ultimately conservation action um, around these waters to secure water for nature and springs in particular. So this first tool I'll talk about, the spring prioritization tool. Um, this was developed to help um, land managers in, and conservation practitioners practitioners in the northern portion of the Sky Island region, so southern Arizona, understand physical, biological, and so, so, social attributes that could contribute to um, conserving springs and understanding which ones we really want to focus attention on. Just lost my mouse. There we go. Um, so springs, why are we focusing on springs? Arizona is the second driest state in the nation, but has the highest number of mapped springs in the United States, which is pretty amazing. These are really special ecosystems that deserve our attention. They're known to harbor great biological diversity and are vital water sources for a diversity of wildlife, um, including endemic species that live only at springs. And importantly, they may be climate refugia and provide a reliable source of water for nature in a warmer and drier future. Springs are also, um, many of them have been altered for human use, uh, but are no longer in use in that way. And so there's opportunities to think about restoration and how we create more of a functioning ecosystem around some of these springs that are reliable and will have water into the future. And then springs are drying up. Not all springs have deep water sources and we're seeing springs drying up across the region. And so we really wanna protect those that are gonna persist into the future and understand more about that for successful conservation. So for our spring prioritization tool, we focused on um, this area in southeastern Arizona over into southwestern New Mexico, looking at Huck 12s between the Mogollon Rim and the US Mexico border. And we approached development of this tool by gathering expert input through a regional working group on key spring attributes. And I see some of the agency folks who assisted with that here on the webinar. Um, it was really important to us that everything was grounded in managers' questions and needs and understanding the context in which spring stewards are making decisions. So we really uh, worked with this context of a regional working group to get that good uh, input. Uh, and we, um, the focus of developing this tool is providing relevant information on springs to help with protective efforts for water resources and then provide a management context for springs. So this is a look at kind of a, a conceptual figure of how we were thinking about, you know, how do we take a lot of different information in to think about which springs need protection, which springs might need restoration, um, what's under threat, what might be resilient to climate change, and all of these different aspects. And so we did a lot of work around thinking through um, how to focus this tool and what sorts of attributes to look at. 
The Springs Stewardship Institute uh, maintains an online Springs database. If you're not familiar with it, you should definitely check it out. It's an amazing resource. Um, they, um, we've worked with them in developing all of our spring survey approaches and, and share data with this database. Um, and it's just really, it was a key part of developing this tool and it's a really amazing resource. And part of um, what the Spring Stewardship Institute has done is develop um, spring survey protocols. And um, these are a combination of inventory protocols. So going out on the landscape and collecting information in the field as well as ecosystem assessment protocols. So looking at um, uh, different qualitative aspects of springs to understand um, relative risk and conservation value between different sites and incorporate information both from the on-site inventory and literature review and interviews with resource managers. And so that was a key piece of us developing this tool as well. So we started out uh, with uh, using data from the Springs online database, 3,891 Springs in our, our um, study area with GIS data. And then within that area over the last, I don't know, seven years or so, we've been doing uh, spring surveys with volunteers and with partner agencies and organizations. And so we had actual survey data for 328 of those springs. And you can see here the breakdown of federal, tribal, state, and private lands. So the vast majority of these springs that we're looking at are on federal lands. So we wanted to think about how we uh, develop a tool that helps us understand conservation value of springs, relative threat, and then isolation, which is um, how far a particular spring is away from other water sources. And so you can see here um, the, the foundation of the tool and the attributes that have gone into it to determine conservation value, threat, and isolation. Um, scores for all map springs are in the bold outline boxes. And that means um, these are all springs. Uh, we had this information through GIS data sources to do this analysis. And then the, the attributes below, um, those bolded boxes are from surveyed springs. And so we were able to include more variables, but only for a subset of springs that had actually been surveyed. So I just wanted to walk you through a little bit of background around these attributes. Um, conservation value variables. So the ones that we were able to look at using GIS data included critical habitat, winter precipitation, and evapotranspiration likelihood. And for this um, evapotranspiration piece, we used the US uh, Chile index as a surrogate measure of how insulation and topographic shading can affect evapotranspiration. So trying to get a sense of uh, resilience, this was one of our ways of thinking about potential resilience into the future. And then for springs that were surveyed, we had a lot more in-depth information. So how much water was at the site, um, uh, the flow of this of water at the site, um, water quality type measurements and habitat integrity, soil integrity, habitat patch size, all coming from that Springs Ecosystem Assessment Protocol approach from the Spring Stewardship Institute. On the threat side, um, on the, for GIS variables where we had data for all the springs, we were able to look at some really self-explanatory um, variables around road density and road proximity, which can be important in terms of disturbance at the site. And then also uh, thinking later on in terms of um, doing restoration at sites as well. Um, the burn risk threat is an important one that we're still doing a lot of thinking about. And for this tool, uh, it was based on percentage of area within 500 meters of the spring site with vegetation at risk of high burn severity. So we were trying to get a sense of risk for damaging or a detrimental burn at the site. And then at our uh, surveyed sites, we're actually able to see things like uh, herbivore impacts, grazing, um, livestock impacts, non-native plant species, which is important, or invasive species, and also non-native animal species. 
And then isolation was a combination of understanding proximity of one spring to another spring on the landscape, the next closest spring, and also to a perennial stream reach on the landscape. So if we think about these waters as being vital for wildlife and other animals, we want to understand if they're uh, really, if like if a particular spring is really far away from other water sources, it might be a higher conservation focus. So the tool uh, breaks down into two basic components. We created an interactive map explorer online with springs categorized by their relative conservation value and threat value based on these attributes we've just talked about. And then in much more detail is an Excel database that um, provides the same information in an Excel format and actually allows users to change the weighting of different variables depending on their management questions and interest. And the spring tool, uh, the, the Excel database provides a lot more in-depth um, information around metadata. Um, the README tab has lots of information on, on methodology and background, as does the scoring method. You can see the raw compiled data behind it. And the weighting, which you can adjust to your liking, depending on your questions again, and then um, providing the prioritization analysis of key findings for all the springs in the region. And this is just a look at how uh, co with conservation value, you can see um, the default here where um, under conservation value, critical habitat, evapotranspiration, likelihood, and winter precipitation are all um, ranked at the same percentage of input. And uh, you can adjust that if, for instance, uh, endangered species protection is of more interest to you, you can ramp up that weight of that variable. And same with the threat variables. And this was something that we heard um, was really important in terms of, of managers differing needs that a one size fits all kind of determination of those things might not be, uh, might not fit the questions that um, all the managers had. And then in the Excel um, format, um, you can see threat uh, springs mapped on their conservation value versus their threat value, which starts to give you some ideas about think, thinking about where to focus effort, which might be, um, focusing some protection effort at a high conservation value spring that's not yet threatened to ensure that it stays protected or focusing somewhere in the mid range of threat and conservation value to try to bring threatened springs into better protection or, or in, do some restoration there to get them to better functioning. So what does all this mean in terms of making conservation decisions? Um, and, Isolated springs is an another, another important piece of the making conservation decisions that I've already mentioned. So understanding which of these sites are potentially um, further away from other sites and therefore in need of, of more attention. We put together as part of the tool uh, FAQ page. Um, so some example management questions that you can get some guidance on how to use the tool for through our FAQ guidance is which springs have water, a really important basic question, which can be harder to answer sometimes than you might think. Uh, which springs are most accessible if you're thinking about restoration projects? Which springs are most threatened? And which springs need protection most urgently? And just a note about data constraints. Um, there were a lot of constraints, as you could see, um, with the number of attributes that we were able to look at with GIS versus surveys on the ground. And so ideally, we would have that survey information for all of these springs to make much more informed decisions. But there was a lot of other information pieces that came up through the process that we just didn't have very good information about, like water rights at sites, um, invasive species, uh, grazing disturbance and groundwater pumping nearby. So not all of this is taken into context in terms of our ratings because we didn't have the data we needed to do that. But I think the, um, the tool is an amazing starting place to then ask some of these deeper questions at particular sites. So you can get to the tool, the, the, both the Excel tool and the um, 
online map viewer through uh, Sky Island Alliance's website, through our water library. And now I'll shift to talk about uh, spring monitoring. So another piece of this project was understanding how are springs being monitored, some different methods. Um, what are we learning from some of the different monitoring approaches that are being used? And the learnings a lot around process and what's feasible and those kinds of things. Um, and we worked with, again, with stakeholder input, um, really trying to gather uh, cross section of information from folks doing a lot of thinking about springs and managing springs to understand how to focus monitoring, what to think about in terms of monitoring and these kinds of things. So some of our stakeholder recommendations I'm gonna share with you, they came out of a workshop we did um, in partnership with the Spring Stewardship Institute at a conference a few years ago where we were fortunate to have lots of uh, folks who specifically were presenting science on springs and doing management work with springs. And some of the findings include that there are some critical gaps in monitoring at springs. Water quality information is often hard to get across a region or not widespread across monitoring efforts. And it's important to understand how water sources are changing and also to give insight into the seasonality of the source potentially. Um, collecting rigorous species occurrence data was another uh, gap that needed uh, that needs attention. Um, curating voucher specimens is something that the group thought was important in terms of, of ensuring rigorous data. And this can be important to understand how species are distributed across the landscape, how important particular springs are for different animals and plants. Um, and invertebrate species are a key part of biological diversity at springs and can be indicators of aquatic ecosystem health and are often not the focus of spring monitoring efforts. And this recommendation was made to conduct spring surveys three times a year to measure seasonal changes and increase the accuracy of understanding of spring conditions. Um, I found this, this recommendation really compelling. Identify and monitor sentinel springs that will serve as reference sites to detect environmental changes across a diversity of spring discharge levels in ecoregions. This is, <clears throat> excuse me, something where, um, you know, if we think about there's so many springs across the landscape and we can only monitor so many of them, you know, how do we think about some sites that might be really important for tracking change over time and these kind of this idea of a sentinel site to invest in monitoring. Um, it, facilitating collaborative monitoring is important. Um, it's a challenge, I won't lie, you all know, um, working between different agencies and entities who all have their own approach from collecting and managing data is, is difficult, but continuing to work toward monitoring where we can look at trends at a landscape scale, especially given the drought issues that we're dealing with and start to see trends and understand early signs of risk and air problems of areas of problem where we might be able to do some conservation interventions is really important. And then uh, this is the, the good old, uh, we need longer term funding for spring monitoring and uh, ensuring that that can continue over time to which, excuse me, it's an important part of springs management. Um, coming out of the stakeholder input, uh, we developed this list of spring monitoring categories that folks felt were most important to focus on. Um, I just wanna acknowledge this is still a really long list and kind of overwhelming uh, if you're trying to monitor multiple sites on the landscape, but obviously the, the flow, the amount of water and uh, trend and seasonality around water amount are important. Water quality, the biological community, which we've talked a bit about, what species are living at the spring, using the spring, are things changing over time? Um, cultural resources, I think I might have cut this off. So this says historical uses, but obviously um, springs have other cultural attributes. In many cases, they're sacred sites for um, the local uh, tribes and indigenous people who have a long standing connection to these sites. And so there's other important cultural attributes as well to think about. 
Um, groundwater is obviously a, a vital piece of the picture in terms of uh, understanding what's going on around the spring as water being extracted, um, and also in terms of water rights. And then climate. So again, the context of what's going on around the spring with air temperature, ground temperature, changes in precipitation, and disturbance uh, is another key piece of monitoring at springs to understand uh, livestock and livestock impacts mining, human development, and also just human use. Um, people hiking to springs and drawing water out of them can create impacts over time. So we looked at three different uh, monitoring approaches in depth as case studies. Um, one of them was this uh, uh, Spring Stewardship Institute, Spring Inventory Protocol and Ecosystem Assessment Protocol that I've been talking about. And the inventory protocol has three levels of survey. Uh, level one is a quick sort of non-expert validation of the location of the spring. Basically, can you find it with the GPS coordinates? Level two uh, is a high expertise and high effort spring assessment of condition and risk. And then level three is uh, longer term monitoring. We also looked at Adopt a Spring, which is a program that Sky Island Alliance uh, piloted over uh, about five years um, to try and collect trend information at a handful, a smaller subset, 10 to 15 springs. So looking at spring flow, area of wet habitat, water quality, and then uh, collecting casual plant and wildlife observations, which was done with a team of minimal, minimally trained volunteers. And we took photo records at the same location during each survey. And then the other uh, approach we looked at was Spring Seeker, another Sky Island Alliance um, project where we have developed a um, mobile app that folks can use in the field to take a short survey of information at a particular spring site, um, looking at things like the water present and um, some key attributes. And the idea being that it can, again, it can be done with very little training and low level of expertise. And so we, we compared these methods to think about trade-offs and provide some guidance around how, how would you think about developing your own monitoring program or what, what kind of depth of monitoring and survey might be necessary. Um, so, and I, I'm referring to all this information which lives in a report, which is also available on our website. So um, you can pull that down as a resource to see all of this more slowly. And I, I, in more in depth. Um, so the, the spring inventory protocol and spring ecosystem assessment that I talked about is really collecting detailed information on geomorphology, habitat array, biota, human uses. And it's all really important information, um, you know, if you're thinking about undertaking restoration and really understanding the ecosystem at a place. Um, whereas the other two approaches are, are much more um, location, water, a bit of what's going on there. Um, so there's real trade-offs between um, time spent and personnel needs um, between these, these different surveys where you're getting really in-depth information and getting very um, minimal information in many cases. But I think um, some key lessons we, we took away from looking at this and thinking this through, I, I pretty much said this, but it's a significant trade-off between depth of survey and then the number of springs that can be surveyed. So you're always working at this tension of you get to a site, you want a lot of information, but it can be arduous to get to a lot of different sites. And so how do you balance you know, the, the, those two issues? Um, we think um, in, in doing this work for years and talking with managers and some partners who've actually gone this route, that using non-expert volunteer effort to collect simple information around location, water presence, simple uh, attributes related to risk, like human disturbance, signs of livestock, as often as possible is a, is a nice baseline to then uh, analyze those data and determine where in-depth and expert assessments are warranted. And so that's a, the approach we've shifted to taking over the last um, year and a half or so.
Uh, something else just that came out of this work was a, a lot of wonderful expert input on best practices around monitoring and learnings from doing this work. Um, lots of different practitioners doing this work over years. So um, I'll just share some of these with you. The, the seasonality of sampling effort to differentiate base flow from spring flow can be uh, from peak spring flow can be really important. So thinking about when you're sampling and if you're only sampling in limited times of the year, what that might mean in terms of your actual knowledge of the site. Um, there's a lot going on at springs. Um, there can have been multiple past uses. Um, there might be present uses that are different than that and potential future uses. And all of these things are influencing condition and management and continuing to seek understanding of those aspects is important. Um, the public information about the location of springs piece is important. Um, it's, it's really important that if there are natural and cultural features that are sensitive, or if the spring is not on public land, for instance, that the information about location is, is protected. And then consolidating spring data through Springs Online, the database uh, maintained online by the Spring Stewardship Institute is really vital in terms of building this wonderful, much more in-depth picture regionally of the state of springs and trends and an important piece of contributing to the long-term study of springs globally. Um, obviously, uh, it's but still worth saying that you need landowner permission for access to any of these sites, depending on who owns the land and also research permits may be required for um, repeated monitoring or, or even one-time surveying. And then the last little recommendation is around thinking about if you're going out multiple times a year, how can you minimize disturbance to the site, um, disturbance to vegetation, limit trail creation, those kinds of things, so that you're not impacting the site through monitoring activities. So we're collecting all this survey and monitoring information, how do we make sense of it? So we created a, a decision tree, um, a series of questions to walk a user through thinking about planning and potential actions. Um, this is a, just a, a bit of a sample of what this looks like, starting with, did you find the spring? Because you don't always find the spring when you go out. And sometimes you find it, but there's no water there. Um, so this walks you through questions around water presence, what land habitat, size, quality, um, cultural attributes and resources present, habitat disturbance, uh, signs of, of other disturbance like pumping, mining, livestock, to start to think about, am I looking at a high conservation value spring? Am I looking at a threatened spring? What might the actions I take next um, look like? And also what else don't I know that I might need to find out to understand the conservation value or threat, uh, you know, risk to the spring. Some examples of, of high conservation value Actions uh, include submitting the information to Springs Online to keep track of the spring in a more regional context, um, considering monitoring annually to tr track condition, and then determining spring risk uh, to develop protect potential protective actions if needed um, that might prevent future degradation. So keep keeping an eye on a, on a really high conservation site to ensure it stays resilient and high conservation value. And then if you're looking at threatened springs, um, some of the example actions include determine if development can be removed or altered to improve access for wildlife. Um, look into pumping if that's something you've identified at the site, uh, speak with land managers and seek policy solutions to limit pumping. Again, monitor the spring to track condition or maybe invasive species is how you landed on it being a threatened spring. And so you wanna look at organizing invasive species removal and working with managers and owners potentially to manage public access if there's sensitive species there or degradation or something like that. All right, I'm gonna shift gears to the Arizona Spring Restoration Handbook. This is a really wonderful resource that's out there in the world if you haven't heard about it and you're working on, on restoration in Arizona. It's on our website. If you Google it, it's also on the Spring Stewardship Institute website. And um, 
looks at some of these pieces we've been talking about with inventory and assessment, uh, spring dependent species, how to think about them in terms of restoration and planning, planning restoration. So various processes to go through as you're thinking about restoration at these sites. And in this project, we created a new addendum to the handbook to try to better address plant restoration in a drought or climate change context, which covers uh, uh, how to think through things like scheduling considerations, the desired function of the site, um, issues around site protection and erosion control, really importantly, selecting plant material type, and then under the plant material selection, thinking about resistance and resilience to climate change. So phenological diversity, if or if possible specificity in terms of connections between blooming plants and animals that rely on that food source can be really important because um, pollinators and animals relying on blooming plants in some cases are getting out of sync with each other as, as migrations change and climate changes. Um, so thinking about phenology in terms of um, the most adequate species, plant species to use through a, a bloom calendar can be a really important tool. And if you really know particular sensitive species you might be targeting, you could get much more specific about their phenological needs and creating a palette of plants that's going to provide a longer food source, bloom time, or, or things like that to support, uh, try to buy time basically for animals and, and pollinate other pollinators that might be um, having changes in their habits because of climate change. And then the other uh, topic we treat in there is space for time substitution. So thinking about a climate gradient such as latitude, elevation, or topographic variation and um, pulling specimens and seed source from the edge of the habitat, a lower elevation, hotter, drier, or maybe a south facing slope, um, alder, for example, um, using that seed source to restore that plant at a higher elevation site or a wetter, cooler site, thinking that that site might be drying in the future. So we go into some depth about that. And then we also cover plant uh, palette options by microhabitat. So thinking about different areas within a spring habitat, like an area with frequent inundation that's really um, needs grass-like plants. Um, so we go through different uh, microhabitats like this to help you think through, okay, what kind of plant source should I be looking for? Uh, what are the relevant traits? And um, how, do, how does it contribute to the ecosystem at the spring? And then the last tool I'll just touch on here um, is uh, this environmental flows policy guide, which we uh, created in partnership with the Water Resources Research Center at the University of Arizona. They've got a long rich history in, in working on environmental flows and understanding environmental water needs. Um, and so we were really looking in this within this challenge I mentioned at the beginning of a lack of policy tools and a regulatory framework to protect water for nature. What can we do? What are some case studies? What information do we have? Um, environmental flows are the amount of water necessary to maintain the health, integrity, and productivity of riparian and aquatic species. They also provide lots of environmental services. And the components of environmental flow include magnitude, frequency, periodicity, duration, and rate of change of flow events. So this is all pretty complex, right? And uh, the Arizona, or the Water Resources Research Center has put together an amazing resource, the Desert Flows Database. It's a compilation of 400 peer-reviewed articles, reports, and book chapters from across the watersheds that touch the Sonoran, Chihuahua, and Mojave deserts. Um, this was supported by the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative, and um, you can access all of this information to start to understand how much water <laughs> do we need to be thinking out about keeping at a particular site to support different kinds of species. So that's the really good news. Um, the the challenge, challenging news is that although research has been conducted 
across many of these watersheds, there's still significant gaps in our knowledge of really basic data, like the location and extent of perennial and intermittent streams, and really understanding different species environmental flow needs. And so that remains an information need in the region. Um, but I encourage you to check out this wonderful resource as well. And within the policy guidebook, um, one of the components were these case studies to look at water allocation or delivery to a natural waterway. So how are folks achieving that with different kinds of tools? Uh, what was the regulatory context and project elements? You know, how did they put this together? And the case studies look at the Bill Williams River, the Colorado River in Glen Canyon, uh, Colorado River Delta in the US-Mexico borderlands, various Pima County streams and reaches, and then the Upper Gila River and San Pedro River, where the Arizona Land and Water Trust has, has led work to develop short-term water transactions that allow the use of water for environmental purposes. Um, they've completed 12 transactions as of 2019, so that's a little dated at this point. Um, and those transactions have contributed 3,000 acre feet of water for the environment through these voluntary agreements uh, with landowners, which can be a very effective tool to allocate water for the environment, especially if we're thinking about small systems like springs and our desert uh, streams and creeks here. And some of the key elements of this project that we highlight in the case study are the community engagement with landowners. Um, work, this was done through workshops on water rights, um, as well as uh, landowner to landowner communication and spreading the message about benefits of short-term water transactions. And then a, an improved landowner understanding of available options helped catalyze these transactions to happen. Um, there are folks out there who, who have a vision uh, of conservation of water for the environment um, like we did with this project. So I will stop there. That's a, a overview of these tools. I know it's, it's a very high level overview for some pretty in-depth tools, but I kind of wanted to give you a sense of, of what's out there, um, a little bit of how it works, and then hopefully you can follow up with, um, we can answer questions now and you can follow up with uh, checking out the website and, and getting your hands on the tool and checking out the map viewer and all of that, the guide, policy guidebook, if it's of interest to you. Hey, thanks so much, Luis. Um, thanks for sharing the impressive amount of work you all are engaged on um, in such an interesting topic. Um, like I mentioned, dropped in the chat, feel free to start dropping questions. But as we said earlier, also feel free to turn on your video and ask questions out loud the good old fashioned way. <laughs> I stump everybody. <laughs> um, Louise, maybe, oh, here we, we have one in. Yeah, one question from David, thanks. Um, besides the Colorado River Project, what other examples are there in Mexico? We didn't have any other case studies in our guidebook from Mexico. Um, I would encourage you to check out that Desert Flows database page. Um, the water research, Resources Research Center may have more information on additional case studies in Mexico. And then Louise, I'm kind of wondering if you can give us um, maybe a a specific example of how monitoring, because you guys have been doing this monitoring now for quite a while, um, how that's helping um, think about drought or adapt to drought or plan for it in those systems that are of a uh, special concern to you. Yeah. Well, one thing um, that I think we, we're still sorting through the data, but when we shifted last year to this spring seeker approach where we had a lot more people out getting more basic information on springs, we started finding a lot more springs that were dry 
And I don't know if that's, you know, we're trying to sort through if that's directly related to the drought last year, like we're real time seeing springs dry up. Um, or, you know, if we're just getting more eyes on the landscape and some of these springs may have dried up longer, a longer time ago. But I mean, basically, um, it points us toward these springs that are having persistent water through this really dire time when we're seeing other springs dry up. And that helps us think about, okay, we, we really need to focus here on protecting the water rights for wildlife as well as other uses. Um, if there's any restoration that could be done to help keep the spring flowing. So thinking about the spring shed, um, you know, fire has been a big piece of our work to the last year or so with the Bighorn fire and the Catalinas thinking about what might be happening with springs there and how do we understand springs at risk for fire? Are there actions we can take ahead of time, ahead of a fire when we know something's high, in a high risk area, when a spring's in a high risk area to try to um, help it survive a fire better or, you know, have less erosive impacts following a fire. So, I mean, so far, a lot of it is like focusing in the right places, right? If there's, if there's springs that are still wet, they become more and more important <laughs> over time, uh, keeping the water there and understanding what's going on there so we can do the actions needed to keep the water flowing there. Hey, thanks for that. Um, one question sent to me directly, uh, I'll just read it out. The extreme drying out of Arizona's isolated water sources in the Southwest caught many wildlife management agencies by surprise and led to thinking about some emergency actions. Has this current drought changed your perspective for conservation or restoration of springs? <laughs> well, I mean, we were stunned when we looked at our, at our data from last year from Spring Seeker to see how many springs were visited that were dry. Um, so yes, I mean, it's, it, it increases the urgency and it, it highlighted for us how little we understand about a lot of these sites really, like how reliable the water is, where it's coming from. Um, so we're looking at really trying to get uh, set up to do some different kinds of water testing at these higher priority sites, high conservation value sites to understand is it really old water that's gonna be persistent and how do we think then about conservation? So that's an important piece where we really started out with at so many of these sites, not even knowing what was on the landscape. So that was step one. And then the more we learn about the different sites where, where it's staying wet, where things are going dry, um, what animals and plants are using or living at the site, you know, then it's like, okay, we can take more informed steps towards uh, restoration and, and protection. Um, and another follow-up from David, uh, David Bohr, uh, in Mexico, specifically in the Chihuahuan Desert area, they're working to establish environmental flows in critical wetlands like Cuatro Cienegas and Hilumes. Uh, he says he knows the laws are different, but in your experience, how has been that issue with landowners and government? So... I actually have not worked directly on establishing these environmental flows. Um, so I think, I mean, what, what am I understanding is from working with um, the Water Resources Research Center and the Arizona Land and Water Trust is there's definitely interest. And in our work in, with, with ranchers in Mexico at Springs, there is interest in a healthy spring because they see the connection between having water for their livelihood and a functioning ecosystem. And so um, I think there's a lot of individual landowner interest on both sides of the border. Um, and it's just, you know, having those conversations and developing those mechanisms here, it, you know, it's required these sort of conservation payments that are about water staying in the stream or staying at the spring. And the tools are probably gonna be really different in Mexico. Yeah, and I know, I know I didn't, maybe I should have given a little more uh, context on how the whole project developed out of thinking about drought and climate change. I kind of left it as a given that, you know, these water sources, like we're thinking about which ones are most important and how to identify those and then take action because there's less water on the landscape overall. So each site becomes so much more important. Mm -hmm. 
any final questions? Does anybody want to unmute and ask a last question? All right. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Louise, and presenting years worth of work um, in a very short <laughs> 40 minutes or so. Um, Sky Island Alliance has done a huge amount of work in the in, in Arizona and in Mexico, um, working with partners in, a, in an incredibly collaborative way and getting all of this information from um, landowners as well as government agencies um, and people just interested in restoration. Um, so um, if you guys aren't familiar with Sky Island Alliance and their work, um, please do check out their website and the links that they have. Um, it's a very collaborative approach, very scientific based approach to doing restoration in the Sky Islands area um, and arid environments in general. Um, and so we really appreciate your time today, Louise. And then um, I'm going to drop some links to CCAST also in our chat if you guys are interested in checking that out more um, as well um, both our youtube channel as well as our homepage and our dashboards where you can find um, some case studies on different topics uh, as we mentioned at the beginning of the hour so thank you everyone for taking the time to join us today uh, this webinar was recorded and we will make it available on the ccast youtube channel and you can also find all of our other webinars there um, and we'll give you an opportunity to share with colleagues if, if they couldn't make it today. If you enjoy learning um, from CCAST and, and these webinars and case studies, please do visit us uh, and the case study dashboard. We currently have um, 118 case studies on there, again, on different topics. And we are working on lining up webinar speakers um, on drought issues in the coming months. Um, if you would like to receive webinar announcements and don't currently get them, please let us know. Contact me or Anna. Um, or if you are interested in presenting your work on drought, um, please let us know that as well. Again, we thank you all for your time. Thank you again, Louise, for joining us and giving us this excellent presentation. We hope everybody has a great day. Thanks.